Okay. So um, I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to the first edition of uh, the SOAS World Philosophies lecture series. Um, it's mainly designed to provide space um, to listen to and engage with experts in uh, world philosophies. And we'll be looking in these lectures at key themes and debates and challenges um, that emerge from the study or research in world philosophies as a broad and diverse approach to philosophy. And this is in fact in, in the spirit of how philosophy is approached here at SOAS um, as a very diverse and rich um, tradition um, that emerged from the various world's tradition and rather from uh, solely the Western perspective. And so we do value a lot the contribution of African philosophy, Indian philosophy, Eastern philosophy, and other world philosophical traditions to the discourse of philosophy in general. And this series provides a space to do that as well. Um, today, we are beginning with um, what I think is a very important way to start talking about the very essence of globalizing philosophy. And we have an eminent philosopher uh, Professor Richard King to speak on that topic of reflections on globalizing philosophy. Uh, but to start that, we would like to call on the um, subject head of the World Philosophies Program here at SOAS, Dr. Sean Hawthorne, to say a thing or two about um, the World Philosophies Program here, and also to properly introduce our guest, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Richard E. King. Uh, and just before that, please remember to uh, mute yourself, uh, particularly as the lecture is going on. And uh, the lecture will go on for about an hour or we'll have a, about an hour for questions and comments. And then you can unmute yourself to say um, your mind. And just raise your hand if you need to. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sean. Thank you, Elvis. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural lecture of the World Philosophies lecture series, which we're hosting here at SAAS University of London. I'm Sean Hawthorne. I'm the convener of the BA program in World Philosophies, which is a program that has really been intent on broadening the uh, panorama of, phil of philosophy as a discipline, particularly the themes with which it engages, but more importantly, the intellectual traditions that it encounters. I'm very delighted, along with Elvis, uh, to introduce our first speaker and my dear friend, Professor Richard King. I first encountered Richard's work when I was a postgraduate student towards the end of the 1990s, when I read his now very famous book, Orientalism and Religion, which was published in 1999, uh, in which he addressed, and I would say also just put very firmly on the table, uh, one of the most important issues facing the academic study of religions, but which scholars have been very slow to engage with. And that was the, the troubling legacy of colonialism and Orientalism and its constitutive role in producing the discipline, in shaping its conceptual apparatus and its priorities. It was one of those texts, I think we could say to coin a philosophical phrase, which shook the field out of its dogmatic slumber. Although I would say that since then, there's still been a lot of work to be done. Now I've returned to this text repeatedly in the last 20 years, both in my own research, certainly in my teaching, to explore the politics of knowledge production and knowledge circulation and the insidious force of colonial conceptuality in shaping how we think. And indeed in telling us who this we is that we repeatedly evoke in the academy. It also teaches us how to escape the bind of coloniality in our disciplinary context, how to avoid its repetition. And Richard's work has really been a continual conversation partner for me over the years, and I've benefited hugely from his careful, humane and illuminating scholarship. Now, even in this text, however, founded as uh, focused as it was on, on European colonial production of the category religion and its construction, particularly of what we now name Hinduism, the book itself was replete with philosophical themes and reflections. 
And this is no surprise given that Richard from the very start of his career straddled both the discipline of philosophy and the discipline of the study of religions. And much of his very extensive work in numerous published volumes, journal articles, conference papers and the like, whether his text on Indian philosophy or the other one on the relationship between Advaita Vedanta and Buddhist thought, or his many articles really pursuing a decolonizing and post-colonial line of questions, has sought to find ways of speaking of and thinking with non-European intellectual traditions in ways that not only do justice to the rich variety of these traditions um, and refusing to reduce them to that most colonial of tools, the category of religion, but also recognizes and puts to work their own conceptual apparatus in order to undo the hegemony of Western thought and to enable the decolonial work of thinking anew. Richard has been a great friend to us at SOAS in helping us, in fact, to put together the BA World Philosophies program, serving as an external examiner for the program and engaging with many uh, fruitful and nourishing conversations about the potential of world philosophies to enable the long overdue uh, overhaul of philosophy itself. Richard has worked in an impressive number of institutions, University of Stirling, University of Derby, uh, Vanderbilt in the States, Glasgow, and finally, or more, most recently, the University of Kent. And it was there that he worked to establish a similar program in global philosophy. And so I'm so pleased he's here today to tell us about that work, to help us in our ongoing reflections about what decolonizing philosophy needs to look like, and perhaps more poignantly, the particular challenges this involves in a context of the neoliberal marketization of higher education and its instrumentalization of metrics as the measure of intellectual quality. So please join me in very warmly welcoming Richard to SAAS um, and, um, and to, um, well, just welcome him to SAAS. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what Richard is speaking of today, which is really global philosophy, its possibility, its intellectual force and value. And the title of the talk is Reflections on Globalizing Philosophy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean, for that lovely, uh, kind and insightful um, introduction. I'm just going to share my screen and, uh, and the PowerPoint that I intend to use, because I think that will um, make things just a little bit easier. Um, let me see if I can. I'm sure there's an easier way of doing this, but how's that? Can you see that? Perfect. Great. Um, I, I'm in a, a, a privileged position. Oh, first of all, thanks for inviting me to SOAS. I have to say, it's looking a lot like my office. Um, but um, I, I'm, I'm in a kind of privileged position here because there are uh, three uh, dimensions of this that uh, experience I want to bring to this. The, the first is that I, two of them relate to SOAS and one of them relate to Kent. Uh, I was... Um, consulted as an external consultant by the institution when the idea of world philosophies was first uh, mooted <clears throat> as an idea uh, at SOAS. So, so I, I was there watching the process right from the very early stages. And then subsequently, um, as Sean said, I uh, served until recently as the external examiner for, for that BA program. So I've seen the early days of that program. And then thirdly, as Sean also said, um, in my own institution at the University of Kent, um, I uh, came up with the idea of developing a, uh, a degree which, which I called global philosophies. Um, there are some questions there about, about that choice of title, which maybe we can get into in the discussion, but that, that was the choice that was eventually uh, uh, started on. And, and what I'd like to do today is... Um, draw upon some kind of theoretical ideas, but mainly uh, in a way that's a little unusual for me because I, I usually like revel in the abstract and, and the theoretical, um, is, is talk about some of the more practical aspects of uh, offer, offering a degree of teaching uh, world philosophies uh, based upon my experience, both 
at a slight distance as an external observer at SOAS, but also in my own capacity when I was head of department of religious studies at Kent in terms of developing uh, such uh, a degree. So, so I'd like to begin by talking about some of the challenges and what I saw as the responses to those challenges in globalizing philosophy. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of those issues uh, and how they fed in very practical ways into my structuring of the degree at Kent. Um, and then we will look, uh, I'll look at uh, some of the kind of uh, challenges, some of them institutional, some of them cultural, some of them economic to that whole project. Um, and then hopefully at the end, um, we'll have time not only for questions, but also I, I'm really interested to hear um, your thoughts and have a discussion about this whole project, which I see SOAS as at the forefront of. So um, I hope that you find these reflections um, of interest. So um, in, in terms of uh, challenges to the globalization of globalization of philosophy. I would say that the, the first main one that I uh, struggled with quite a lot in my own work um, is the question of uh, Eurocentrism uh, or the essentially summed up as the, the West is best bias, which is pretty well established within, not surprisingly, you might argue, the Western Academy um, or the idea, not even that the West is best, but West is normative that, that the, the way that Western culture, Western civilization has thought about the world is necessarily the, the natural or normal or best way of, of thinking about the world. Um, and in reflecting upon this, um, I found that one of the ways to embed a response to that within the development of a degree um, is to reflect upon and recognize the so social and cultural location of thought. I think that's uh, an important element of the process of globalizing philosophy is recognizing that what people are calling philosophy in different cultural contexts are formed within those contexts. So thought doesn't occur in the abstract, even though one can discuss it in the abstract, it's formed in social cultural and institutional ways. And this, this point is sometimes lost in uh, mainstream philosophical discussion. The idea being we're not really interested in the social or cultural location of ideas. We want to discuss them, if you like, on their own logical or philosophical merit. So there's a kind of abstraction that occurs that, uh, that I think uh, does a disservice to our understanding of the complexity of those traditions and where they where they come from. A second challenge, which I'll come back to also at the end, um, is, a, is one of a disciplinary or institutional challenge. And this is the issue of disciplinary territorialization. SOAS in uh, some regards was in a, a unique position for a, an institution of its kind um, in that it does not have a, a freestanding independent philosophy department already in existence. Mm. The challenge that I had um, at the University of Kent was that there was already a philosophy department um, that uh, did philosophy, Western philosophy mainly but not exclusively in the kind of analytic uh, framework or, or, or style, if you like. Um, and, and so that creates a, a, a different kind of politic that, that perhaps is worth reflecting upon uh, in terms of how you would develop such a degree, given that uh, there's a department already in existence, which is using that uh, title. Um, and, and the response uh, to that, I would say, depends on local institutional conditions. So SOAS so will have a different set of challenges or did have in relation to that. Um, and at Kent, I had my own challenges in terms of uh, keeping on board uh, the philosophy department in these processes. Um, and that was also one of the uh, aspects behind the naming of the degree. Um, it became clear that there was uh, a great deal of anxiety, let's say, about the use of the term philosophy at Kent outside of the department of philosophy. Um, 
And so that's one reason why the degree became known as global philosophies, because the study of philosophies was seen as somehow a kind of study of worldviews that sounds like something a religious studies department might do, but it isn't philosophy, which is what we do in philosophy. Uh, and so there's that there's a kind of territorial claim being made there, which affects the, the title of the degree. But there's a third issue, which I think is one that many people who work in uh, the study of ancient, medieval and historical forms have to encounter. And that's what I would call presentism, which is the deeply embedded set of assumptions in the modern academy, which uh, tend to prioritize, sometimes without reflection, um, a kind of secularized model of modernity and, and a kind of uh, implicit myth of progress. Um, I see this, uh, this kind of attitude being expressed quite a lot uh, amongst colleagues in other departments um, who sort of think, for instance, that because I, I worked in religious studies, that religion is somehow passe, it's out of date, it's not relevant okay. anymore. Yeah. But, but those kinds of uh, issues um, one has to uh, um, deal with. And I decided that in thinking through how to develop the program at Kent, that we would uh, meet those full on. Uh, and so one of the, the kind of guiding principles I had in developing this degree was, was to challenge the exceptionalism of those accounts. Um, because I think it's only if you, if you do that, uh, that you are actually able to step outside of a very narrow uh, disciplinary framework in terms of uh, considering what is and isn't uh, philosophy. So uh, focusing upon uh, one of the points I brought up, the locatedness of, of thought, um, I would suggest that uh, Western philosophy is often presented, not always, and it does depend upon the, the, the style. Western philosophy, of course, is not a singular thing, but it's often presented particularly within uh, those forms of, or philosophical traditions that are uh, sometimes called Anglo-American or, or more analytically oriented. Um, as the discovery of universal truths based upon the um, abstract exercise of reason, the Greek logos. But the problem, um, and, and that but, uh, it's a big but, if you pardon the phrase, um, is that philosophy will in fact uh, look different depending upon its historical and cultural location. Uh, and we have to accept this point, I think, um, otherwise we are assuming that the conversations that we might be familiar with, when I say we here, I'm thinking of white, those who are trained within the white Western Academy, um, the conversations that we are used to um, are not necessarily the only ways in which conversations can be had. Um, I try and address this point uh, to students by, um, asking them to reflect upon when they go to a party. Maybe they just come, they're freshers at university, they go to a party, they don't know anyone. And, and they're maybe experiencing social anxiety, they're trying to fit in, they're trying to break into pre-existing groups who are already having a conversation. Um, and within the terms of that conversation, um, there's the issue of how, how you enter into it. Do you enter into it and speak about the experience of those within that group, maybe they come from a different part of the country or a different part of the world, and your uh, background experience isn't the same. Um, so um, in other words, we shouldn't expect when we, when we go to these parties, <laughs> when we develop something called world philosophies or global philosophies, um, that the kind of thought that we will encounter will, will, will be the same. Um, there will be local differences. There will be different points of emphasis. That's not to say there aren't commonalities, and I'm not making the uh, kind of radical separatist claim that these, these are uh, uh, cannot uh, talk across cultures, but we have to accept uh, the reality of difference and not see that difference as a way of uh, excluding some and not others from a widening 
of the conversation, which is what I see the globalization of philosophy as fundamentally about, a widening of the human conversation. Now, when we look back uh, in uh, Western culture at uh, the whole question of the origins of philosophy, um, we'll, we'll see that there are, there are basically two main strands. There's the, those who have argued that philosophy has begun independently different in different places, Africa, uh, India, the West, and so on, Greece, um, and those who argue very, very specifically for the Greek origins of philosophy. The word philosophy, of course, is philosophia, the love of wisdom. Uh, and, I, and I've given here just some examples on each side of uh, writers and thinkers who have uh, argued on the from these two different points of view. Um, and I think it's fair to say uh, that in uh, recent centuries since this that debate arose, it was those on the left who argued for the pluralistic origins of philosophy who tended to be in the ascendancy. But that's not been the case in more recent times and certainly throughout the 20th century, we've seen this idea that philosophy began in one particular place in Greece at a particular time, um, the specificity thesis, if you like, or the, um, and that, that has come to dominate 20th century accounts of the history of philosophy. And, and if you look at some of the key textbooks, for instance, which is often a way of tracking uh, what, what the kind of general perception within the academic circles are, um, there, there's overwhelmingly a tendency to locate the beginnings of philosophy in ancient Greece. Uh, and of course, this is part of uh, a longer tale of European exceptionalism. Uh, the idea that Greece is the birthplace of philosophy, that it's the birthplace of many of our uh, ideas of democracy. Um, so, so this involves, of course, a very, very specialized or specific way of approaching philosophia, um, seeing it as something that only really developed or, or developed in its most perfect form, if you like, uh, as some might put it, um, in Greece. Uh, the, and this has often been portrayed as, as the triumph of logos, the spark of reason, of logical argumentation over ancient mythos, a myth. Um, and of course, this is conceptualized in, in characterizations of Socrates um, and the fact that he got into a great deal of trouble for um, questioning uh, aspects of the a mythological uh, uh, aspect of the gods uh, and focused upon the importance of drawing out wisdom through dialogue, through the Socratic dialogue. But I would argue that this story, which is quite modern in many respects, um, is itself a, a, an origin myth for philosophy. And it's something that uh, philosophy should investigate. Should, it should be part of the remit. Uh, and that's something I'll, I'll have something to say about. In this regard, um, I, I draw your attention, if you're not already aware of it, of, of the uh, interesting article by Robert Bernasconi, who's, who's written quite a bit about uh, philosophy and race and philosophy, um, where he, he makes this, asks this particularly pertinent question. What is one to make, he says, of the apparent tension between the alleged universality of reason and the fact that its upholders are so intent on localizing its historical instantiation. Um, and he goes on, uh, I'll just put the longer quote here because I think this draws out some of the implications that, that he would see from this. Uh, he says, one cannot understand why there has never been a serious debate about the origin of philosophy unless one understands what is at stake in the question. Even if the history of the discipline and the conception of the discipline that history supports, that history supports is not racist in design, the question must still be addressed as to whether it is racist in its effects. Whole peoples experience themselves as excluded in part because of the systematic diminishment of the achievements of their group. Philosophers almost everywhere are implicated, 
The problem must be addressed not just in research, but also at the institutional level in each and every department. And of course, I um, want to focus in, in, in this talk on that last point upon addressing that, <coughs> excuse me, at the institutional level. So let me say a few things just to kind of pull, pull this down into some specifics that we can then pull apart and discuss later of how I conceptualize global philosophies at the University of Kent. How, for instance, does uh, global philosophies as, as, as it's called or was called, that's something we can get into, um, how does it differ from a traditional philosophy degree? So let me outline ways in which I think uh, it, it's an attempt to be different. Firstly, perhaps somewhat obviously, um, is the global remit of the degree, that the degree would be explicitly cross-cultural and comparativist in orientation. Those of us who work uh, or are, are disciplined within religious studies uh, will know of the writings of Max Muller, the uh, Indologist, and his famous axiom, which he took from adapting Goethe, um, that in the study of religion, he who knows one knows none. Um, this idea that to truly understand something, you must look at, uh, you must make the cross-cultural move. You must look at instantiations of it outside of one particular example, which, um, uh, which he was putting forward, um, uh, Mueller, as a, as a kind of uh, basis for a science of religions. A, a science must be, uh, you must be able to test the hypothesis. You must be able to take, uh, have other examples to kind of test what you're studying. So there's a global and a cross-cultural dimension to that. Secondly, um, I very much argued uh, at Kent that there had to be a historical element um, to this process, um, that there had to be a sense in which we were engaging philosophical ideas but also engaging in the global history of ideas. Uh, some of my colleagues um, in philosophy um, felt that there was a strong separation here and that, for, although I think that's partly an illusion, um, there's quite a lot of history of philosophy in philosophy degrees traditionally. Um, but the idea that uh, there's a kind of separation of, of method and, and work here um, was summed up in the idea that the belief um, that what we were doing in a religious studies department was a kind of history of ideas. We, we were kind of describing uh, different points of view, presenting them, um, whereas what they're doing in philosophy is they're directly engaging with truth questions, with questions of a philosophy as opposed to uh, history of ideas. I think that distinction is overly drawn, but, but for me it was important to uh, highlight the fact that that this degree would have uh, would be also a history of a global history of ideas. It's also important when using words like global that you recognize also the importance of the local. Um, and so what I tried to embed in this degree was um, attention to the cultural, social, linguistic and historical contexts of ideas something that can perhaps be summed up in the, uh, the idea of the social construction of knowledge and thought, that the ideas don't just exist in the abstract, that they occur in particular places, in particular times, and that those thoughts are thought through the medium of particular languages, a point that is sometimes um, not considered, let's say, in traditional uh, philosophical discussions. And then the fourth aspect of this that I thought was important to embed in the degree was a certain uh, reflexivity. The idea that if you were studying this degree, you would be engaging critically with issues of definitions, of boundaries, of the categories that you use, and also would be asked to reflect upon the, the question of translation what goes on when you translate something? 
particularly when you translate a set of ideas or concepts that are embedded in a particular institutional form and language. As we all know, when you translate something, to put it rather simplistically, you add something, but you also take something away because it's a translation. Um, and so part of the idea there is, is to be reflexive, to, 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 to be aware of that, pra that, tra that, that process, that transformation. And that those definitions that we use, the categories that we use, and the translations that we use were part of the thing that we are studying. They are up for discussion uh, in a kind of open-ended uh, way. And that what we're doing when we're teaching students how to do this is we're making them reflect upon those fundamental conceptual tools that we are using. Now I'm mentioning this because when I, uh, is, I assume it's the same at the University uh, at SOAS, but at the University of Kent, when you uh, are developing a new degree, you, uh, you have to map it, its program aims, to a set of subject benchmarks. Um, and so in developing this degree, I mapped the global philosophies degree in relation to three different areas, because I felt that this, and, I, I, and I'm mentioning this because I think this captures something of the, uh, the phenomenon uh, of, of the degree and what it's trying to do. So the three subject benchmark uh, statements that I, I drew upon were philosophy, fairly obviously, um, but also uh, languages, cultures, and societies, which allows for the historical and the translational and the hermeneutic questions uh, that are uh, I, I see part and parcel of this sort of degree. And then thirdly, area studies, because anyone who's studying world philosophies or global philosophies would have to be involved in the study of specific regions. Um, and, and so those were the three, the three kind of defining benchmarks in, in the kind of administrative process of developing this degree. Um, and it will be interesting, um, I don't remember what, uh, what you did at SOAS in terms of the benchmarks, but when we get to the discussion, it will be interesting to know which benchmark statements uh, you used. So um, in developing this, what did I see as the kind of distinctive components of that degree, of the global philosophies degree? Well, philosophy often presents itself as, uh, or at least philosophers present what they're doing as the examination of fundamental or first principles. Um, so you might do science, you might be studying religion, you might be studying the mind, but what philosophers do is they, they are studying that, but they're also studying the fundamental assumptions and principles underlying those fields. I see that as a constitu constitutive aspect of, of what a philosophical approach is about. Um, but one of the things that I found strange, and this relates back to Bernasconi's point, um, is that what we, while we'll, we see courses on philosophy of religion or philosophy of mind, philosophy of science, what we don't see, and I think philosophers might try to argue that this is because it's implicit in what they do, but I, I'm not sure that it is in practice, is we don't see the philosophy of philosophy. We don't see that first stage examination of the very principle of what philosophy is um, foregrounded within the subject. Uh, what we often find um, is that students are introduced to philosophy and, uh, and the different ways of doing it, but they're introduced to it often in a historical way. And that historical way usually embeds a canon of who are philosophers and who aren't. And because that canon is usually heavily defined by European civilization, um, it tends to embed a set of assumptions about philosophy, which are strongly linked to the European tradition uh, and to that tradition which locates itself in Greece, for instance. Um, if you start, if you say that the first philosophers were like Thales, the pre-Socratic thinker, or, or, you, or you start looking at Plato and Socrates, you're already, even if you're not uh, explicitly doing that, 
you're implicitly passing on a, a set of assumptions about what philosophy might be in its first principles. And so I, um, I felt that a degree such as this has to foreground, uh, or as I would like to see it, complete the philosophy project, because the philosophy project is incomplete if it does not investigate itself and its own foundations. So the philosophy of philosophy is itself uh, an aspect of that process. That's one way to put it anyway. Now, in terms of uh, what world philosophies or global philosophies uh, entails, um, I just briefly want to outline two models. Um, there are other ways you can conceptualize this and, I, and I'm sure we can complicate this, but for the sake of the discussion, the first one, the first model of world philosophy, I would describe as adjunctive. Um, it's liberal, multicultural uh, in its uh, intentions, which is to extend essentially Western philosophical discussions. I, 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 can't, I, can't, I would often come across, um, quote, open-minded uh, philosoph uh, philosophers in, in various departments of philosophy and in institutions I've worked in who were interested in the work that I was doing and wanted to talk to me about the philosophical questions as they saw it. Um, and it would soon become clear to me that for them, uh, this was about finding correlates of their own sets of conversations within, in my case, Indian traditions, um, and then um, translating them into the terms of that conversation and then and then engaging in in a discussion and this is uh in some a certain level a kind of laudable thing an extension of discussion and so on um uh, but there was rarely a, a reflection upon the issue of the translation of those materials into the western linguistic and conceptual framework um and and this relates to what i considered to be a superior paradigm, which is to see world philosophy as a transformative exercise. Uh, that is, um, it involves an expansion of what philosophy means. And that expansion uh, means something that is between uh, and perhaps beyond specific traditions of thought. So, uh, from that point of view, when you when you bring Indian philosophical ideas, let's say, into a discussion uh, that is uh, about a particular issue, um, that the way in which that's approached, the, the, the linguistic differences, the historical and cultural and institutional factors that form that dis those different discussions, will create something different from those two. Uh, and that's much more than a kind of adjunctive idea of world philosophy. That, that's where one really is attempting to open up conversations um, and transform them in the process. Now, this, uh, this project uh, is very much part of uh, what I would call the decolonization of wisdom. Um, and I just wanted to mention uh, this is one of my favorite quotes from Michel Foucault. Foucault, um, in, in many regards, doesn't represent a good example um, of, uh, of, of a, of a post-colonial or decolonial thinker because he's very much embedded within the European um, But um, this quote, which is from an interview that he had in Japan in 1978, I, I find uh, quite a, an intriguing and, and, and an interesting one. This is what Foucault says. He's asked the question, by the way, can, he's in Japan, he's being asked whether Asian thought can help the crisis of Western thought. The question is the leading question to start with, but it's one that he accepts the premise of, and he, and he replies in the following manner. It's true, European thought finds itself at a turning point. This turning point on an historical scale is nothing other than the end of imperialism. The crisis of Western thought is identical to the end of imperialism. The crisis has produced no supreme philosopher who excels in signifying that crisis. And he goes on, for it is the end of the era of Western philosophy, 
Thus, if philosophy of the future exists, it must be born outside of Europe or equally born in consequence of meetings and impacts between Europe and non-Europe. Now, as I say, I'm not holding up Foucault as particularly a good example of someone who ful fulfills that project. Um, I, I'm just, I just find his analysis interesting because what, what he's suggesting is that the, uh, the impasse, the crisis as he sees it of Western thought is precisely linked to the fact that the West is uh, no longer supported by the pillars of empire. Um, those disappear first in the mili military and political contexts, but they also, uh, their underpinning of claims of intellectual superiority are also lost in that process. And in that process, the Western philosopher is exposed uh, in the parochialism of the original claim that the West has or invented philosophy. Now, um, in my own work, um, I have uh, been interested in this process of translating the love of wisdom, and particularly the question of who gets to decide what is it that we call philosophy. And so in, in, a, in a number of works in different kinds of ways, there are different ways to approach uh, what, what I've written, I guess. Um, but one of them um, is to consider uh, the ways in which uh, traditions of thought become classified as isms or religions um, when brought into discussion with uh, European modes of thought. So many of the universalizing or globalizing intellectual traditions of the pre-modern world are the ones that have been classified by us in the West as religions or isms. Here are some examples, Judaism, Hinduism, Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, Islam. Now, um, all of the above have been translated into Western Christian, arguably in some cases post-Christian uh, paradigms through this concept of religion. And what I've tried to do in various works from Orientalism and religion onwards is, is try and highlight that and, uh, and unpack ways in which through that categorial move of placing them within the category of religion, um, this separates them from what the West would call philosophy, science, medicine, politics. Because of course, in, in the classic um, enlightenment or, or, or if you like, Westphalian worldview, uh, that there's the separation of the secular and the religious. Uh, uh, and so there are certain domains that are seen as public philosophy, science, medicine, and politics, and certain domains that are seen as private uh, religion being uh, a clear example. And if we don't question this separation, which is a separation that I feel quite strongly at an individual level, because um, I've always thought of myself as a philosopher, but I've never been institutionally recognized as a philosopher. I've always been located within a religious studies department. Um, and and that's, so that's, the, the that's where I'm disciplined by the institution. Um, uh, and it's, it's, so it's always been a struggle to have conversations with other people who call themselves philosophers because they don't consider what I'm doing to be philosophy. So it's something that I, throughout my career, felt quite personally, uh, but also I think reflect, reflective of a much larger issue about the classification of non-Western cultures and traditions. And of course, the, the, the kind of bottom line, the outcome of this is that it's through the, these, the unquestioning use of these separations that modern so-called secular Europe has been secured as the center and the focal point of world history. You get people like Dipesh Chakrabarti arguing that history essentially is mostly written as a kind of Xerox or, or a, a photocopy of European history, which is then adapted to fit regions. So you have Indian history, Korean history, and so on, which are essentially repeating some of the categorical assumptions of European historiography, but adapted 
to the region, but without thinking through the whole idea of what it might be to write a history from that region rather than of that region. So that brings up the question of what counts as world philosophy, the whole question of boundaries and definitions. Um, and at one level, of course, it, it's relatively straightforward, given uh, what, we, what has been said, to say what would count as world philosophy. It's, for want of a better phrase, global intellectual thought, the various philosophical traditions or intellectual traditions of the world. You might argue there's question begging there. You're already deciding that that's called philosophy. Um, but certainly to expand philosophy and onto a world stage, examples, Greco-Roman, European, Indian, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Jewish, Christian, Egyptian, African, and so on. These are the kinds of things that one would imagine uh, encountering within a world philosophy degree to bring it down to that kind of uh, curriculum level. But if you um, base uh, the construction of the degree upon the second model that I outlined, the transformative model, then world philosophy is not a case of narrowly finding correlates or mirrors of Western, modern Western philosophical discussions and traditions, or even of Christian theology. Um, we have to, if you like, cast the, the, the light much further than that, because we can't assume that the particular cultural, historical, and institutional conditions under which philosophy emerges as a distinct discipline in the West will have occurred elsewhere. And so we have to be prepared to, 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 to cast our uh, light quite widely. Now, in trying to develop what this degree was about, which is again, something that a degree that remains up for discussion, <laughs> even within itself, um, the approach I took, again, very much reflected my own youthful experience. As always, when developing undergraduate degrees, I think it's important to reflect, what was I thinking when I was 17? <laughs> and I, I'm probably unusual. Uh, I, I suspect we all are as academics uh, fr uh, from uh, most people in this regard. But when I decided to go to university, I decided to do, um, a I wanted to do philosophy. But I was worried because I looked into it that what counted as philosophy uh, when I looked at the, the courses seemed very, very Western. And I'd, be, I'd developed an interest since I was about 14 in what at the time I would have called Eastern philosophy. Um, and, and, and I wanted to learn more about that. And so I learned even at that stage that if I wanted to study that, I couldn't go to a philosophy department. I had to go to a religious studies department. So I ended up doing a joint degree. I did philosophy and religious studies. And so I'd be able to have the kind of in-depth study of Western philosophers in the philosophy part of my degree. But then if I wanted to look at anything non-Western, then I could cross the corridor and do that in uh, religious studies. Um, but the, the kinds of questions that drove me to want to do a degree in philosophy, I discovered were not really discussed very often in, in the philosophy courses that I was doing. We weren't discussing fundamental questions of meaning and identity. We would discuss quine and, and logical forms, and we would discuss uh, qualia, uh, theories of perception, um, uh, philosophy of mind. We, 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 would, we would look at, at uh, um, ethics questions, but questions about fundamental human identity. What, what, is, what is my life about? What's the meaning of it? Where does meaning come from? These kinds of questions, whilst philosophers in the West talk about them, um, aren't necessarily those that are foregrounded in philosophy degrees. Um, and so um, that turned me also towards the religious studies department, because of course in religious studies, those questions are very much part of uh, the discussion. And so in terms of folding th this in, um, I decided uh, 
that the, the study of world philosophies at Kent at least should involve reflections upon world myth and literature. Um, that we should look widely uh, with a broad spectrum uh, in, in trying to find philosophical ideas and thoughts, what humans have thought about the nature of the universe, of the human, of life and meaning, of gender and sex relations, of ethics, of community, of our relationship to nature. All of these things, attitudes, expressions of them can be found within what we would call mythological uh, material. Um, and so I folded that in to the, the, the degree. Um, now, one might argue that's, that's, there's some issues there and I'm happy for us to discuss that, but that was a, a decision that I, I made and we can discuss that. Um, so that left a very broad remit for this degree at Kent. We had, uh, for want of, of classifying this, we had philosophies, logos, but also myths or mythos uh, as, as the things that would be studied. One of the questions that came up, and again, this is where one is also thinking locally and institutionally, was um, how to relate to a broad series of uh, cultural phenomena that might not necessarily be, let's say, always, fun always focusing upon the cognitive. Within my department at, at Kent, um, half of my colleagues were not really philosophers. They, they worked within what you might call the sociology of religion. Um, and, and so the, the question would be, there was a very practical question of how do you deliver this degree uh, uh, in a way that matches the, the staff that you have. <laughs> the, 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 um, and, and so this brought up the question, which I think is also one worth reflecting upon for anyone developing degrees such as this is whether you should include the study of rituals and social institutions. Um, it's, it's one thing to extend the discussion to looking at myths, stories, if you like, um, but also much of how people express their sense of who they are or their relationship to, other, to animals or nature or to, or to each other in terms of gender and so on. Um, are embedded in rituals and social institutions. And so perhaps that's also a part of a broadened out uh, philosophical uh, remit. Again, that's, that's one for reflection. Of course, uh, global philosophies at Kent was about the study of worldviews, both ancient and contemporary. Uh, the, the kind of remit I felt for that was what, what, is it, what is it that has oriented people's sense of human identity and meaning both historically and today in the, in the early 21st century? I feel more probably than at any point in the history of British higher education, when developing a, an undergraduate degree, we are forced by circumstances to think upon that uh, in terms of relevance and uh, market. We, um, that's not necessarily always a bad idea. You won't hear me say that very often, but in this context, uh, it, is, it is good to reflect upon what, what, uh, what speaks to people, what will speak to 17 and 18 year olds uh, in terms of meeting their interests of the life that they're living and the, and the world that they're entering into. And that means a focus upon the contemporary. So as well as looking at uh, ancient worldviews or, or what has often been classified as the world religions, I, I consider that to be part of the remit of uh, what uh, global philosophies would be about. I think it's also about looking at the forms of human identity and meaning construction that are prevalent in the modern world. Some examples, consumer capitalism, scientific rationalism, atheism. These are, these are all ways in which people define their sense of who they are, uh, either through the, the life that they practice or, or, or through explicit uh, adherence to a particular uh, view. So for me, 
I actually think this is also true for, for religion, as I understand it. Uh, part of the remit of such a degree would involve the examination of capitalism, of scientific rationalism, of atheism as aspects of ways in which people think about who they are and what the world is about. Then um, I just wanted to say a few things about the, the, the importance of the world or the global aspect as I, as I draw things um, to a close. Um, for me, um, one of the reasons I uh, chose the name global rather than world, um, although uh, you can decide on whether you think that's a good idea or not, was that I wanted the degree to include within it some reflections on the nature of the global and of globalization itself as a, as a term that requires understanding and interrogation. Because it's, it's also the case that when people talk about globalization, they usually think of it as a very contemporary phenomenon. Um, but I think that it's worth considering the, uh, the argument, the idea that, that what we now call the world religions are often the partially globalized ideologies and belief systems of the previous era. The spread of Buddhism from India um, across uh, to become a pan-Asian movement and, and in the modern period uh, beyond that is an example of a, a kind of partial globalization. And one of the reasons why you know, we, we study and why I study Buddhism is partly because of its success in that regard. So we can come to understand something of notions of the global and of globalizing processes uh, through uh, looking at those traditions. So in other words, part of uh, the import of the, wor the world or the global aspect would be the study of previous globalizations. Uh, examples, the spread of Buddhism, the Roman Empire, the, 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 the missionary spread of Christianity, of Islam, the Mongol Empire, the British Empire, of course, the American Empire. Um, and, and these these moments, these historical moments, these, these trends, these processes, uh, I see as part of the remit of the degree. But I also wanted to um, mark what I thought was significant about this, uh, this degree uh, in two fundamental levels. For, uh, at, at the level of the, of the individual student and at, at, at the macro level. So at the level of uh, the individual student, um, uh, in that degree, the idea is that we would also study now, the contemporary, uh, and what would be folded into that would be what I think many students who become interested in such degrees uh, are driven by, which is their own individual search for existential meaning around the world. I mean, that's certainly, I think, one of the dimensions of, of my own choice to, to choose the degree that I did. And I, and I think that we still have within, student, within our student body, students who are on that kind of quest. And I think that's part of what this degree offers for them. But also at the macro level, it, it's the study of now in terms of reflections upon the global as it is now on the socio-political, global media, politics, uh, the spread of global capitalism, the rise of digital technologies, new forms of community that are forming in, in that context. What are the new philosophies and ideas that are linked to these new technologies and these new movements. These kinds of ideas and these kinds of modules were already in existence at Kent, and I'm sure you have some uh, at SOAS too, but they were not considered philosophy uh, necessarily, but, but within the remit of this degree, um, I considered them part of the, the, the whole process. Of course, there's a, there's a practical aspect to this. If you're building something like world or global uh, philosophies, um, you, ha you have a, a challenge, which is uh, what's available. 
what what do you have in terms of academic staffing modules that are already in existence how can you draw upon other departments as they're uh, classified um, to build this um, rather ambitious i have to say uh, uh, project but so let me let me briefly tell you what i did at kent just so you have a sense of uh, how i tried to create something out of very little <laughs> at the University of Kent. Um, so at Kent, what happened uh, in the degree is that at, at the beginning in, in stage one, students would do two core courses. One was called the Global Search for Meaning. Uh, and in that, that was really an introduction to the degree, to, to the kinds of things that I'd been talking about, to, to the idea of philosophy, to the idea of the study of myth, uh, maybe the st uh, study of ritual, though that would come in the second module. Um, and that would, of course, vary according to the um, staff involved, but would basically be exploring this very broad frame of, of exploring what it is for hu how humans have made sense of themselves and the world that they live in. And then in the second semester, they do a, a core course called Ethics, Society and the Good Life. Uh, this was the, the module where some of my sociology of religion colleagues could contribute uh, and there it's looking at different notions of what it is to lead a good life and that again that can be these courses are, uh, are created as as shells in in that modern way in which we do this with learning outcomes and so on so that different staffing components can work within that dependent upon conditions like uh, sabbatical remember when people had sabbatical um, and uh, and so, so there it would be reflections on the good life, um, ethics and society in different cultural contexts. And then uh, feeding into that, um, I folded into this um, some courses that weren't core for the degree, but were core for another degree that I developed at Kent, which was a degree in Asian studies. And so students would, would either do an introduction to South Asian traditions or an introduction to East Asian traditions. Um, we didn't have the resources to be able to expand beyond that uh, in terms of other traditions and other cultures. But it was important to embed within this the idea that you couldn't go through this course without some kind of at least early level engagement with, uh, in this case, um, Asian traditions. And then, uh, and then when students moved into um, stage two, they would have a core course um, called, it's not called that anymore, but it was called Understanding Global Philosophies. Uh, and, and essentially what this was, um, was a, a theory, a method course for global philosophies. It's, it's how might you do this thing that I've just been talking about for an hour? Um, what are the theoretical, hermeneutic, political, cross-cultural issues involved in that? Um, and and I, I put there the kind of extended description of what that module was about, but, it, but as you can see, it, it was quite broad, again, reflective of a kind of pragmatic need to allow for different staff members contributing their different expertise. But essentially, the focus there was not upon uh, a reflection on, on different cultural traditions of thought, but upon the very kind of nitty gritty for me, theoretical, categorical and methodological issues that are involved when you move your study into a cross-cultural space. Um, and then, uh, I mean, that, that, that might be seen, and I think it is, as, as quite bare bones, the rest of the degree was constructed out of modules that were taught at the University of Kent in uh, a variety in the philosophy department in the religious studies department, uh, courses on um, African history, um, uh, sociology courses on media and on China and so on. So, that, so there, was, there was a wide remit of uh, modules that were pulled in at that point, but this became the kind of spine of uh, the degree. So let me uh, finish my remarks with um, some notes of caution and the tale of defeat, <laughs> because uh, essentially when, when I developed the uh, degree uh, program in global 
philosophies at Kent. Uh, it was probably at arguably the worst time ever to introduce a new humanities degree because we are, as you will all be aware, uh, suffering a kind of crisis of the humanities in, in a higher education environment that has been marketized um, and with uh, state, uh, with, with government regularly making uh, statements suggesting that perhaps humanities aren't like the best degree to do. Maybe you should do STEM degrees instead. Um, and, and so in that context, um, the fundamental question, which I think SOAS is, is much better placed than Kent was, is the question of does the institutional platform match the scale, scope and vision? So it's all very well at one level having this kind of grand vision of, of what philosophy might be in a globalized context. But if the institution cannot support that, ultimately through a variety of factors, um, not just academic staff specialisms, but also at the basic level of humanities programs are shrinking, um, then, you know, that that's, that could be a killer issue. And, and I should say that as far as I'm aware, the degree has uh, not been presented to students for 2021 access. I looked, I, I've, now, I've now left Kent, but I, I looked at the uh, UCAS um, page and, and I couldn't find, find it for 2021, although it's there for 2020, um, which doesn't surprise me uh, because um, it's very difficult to find a, um, a space for something called global philosophies that's necessarily got the, if you like, brand recognition of philosophy when you also have a degree uh, in philosophy being offered independently uh, within the same institution. And that brings me to the, the second uh, note of caution, which is the politics of intra-institutional intra competition. Who gets to use the label philosophy? SOAS, I think, um, has had has the advantage of, of not having within itself a freestanding philosophy department, which enabled that space to, if you pardon this way of speaking about it, to be colonized by religious studies. Um, but I didn't have that advantage uh, at Kent, um, where there was already an, an existing philosophy degree um, and understandable um, anxieties about my attempt to introduce something that might be seen as a challenge to that degree. And that was one reason why I, I was not allowed to use the word philosophy. I, I had to pluralize it to philosophies. Um, and I found that some, some, some of my colleagues would suggest that, that they'd have some students who they would consider less interested in the analytic, more interested in the spiritual, and they would say, oh, well, well, maybe you want to do global philosophies because you know, maybe this isn't the right place for you. But, but so there is an issue there of, of uh, uh, intra-institutional territory. But of course, um, in this time that we live in, bottom lines and the economic environment uh, are crucial. Um, and fundamentally, um, anyone who's had to do this in any British institution knows that the fundamental question that's asked of the academics is, is there a market for such programs? Um, and so that's always something that one has to foreground in uh, getting these things accepted by institutions. It would be lovely if we could be driven by the academic vision, but there's also the, the kind of pragmatic uh, market-based approach. Um, but I would argue, um, I mean, SOAS has been successful in this regard, and I'm interested to hear more about that. But I would argue that actually one of the challenges that I'm about to mention is actually a demonstration that there is a market for these degrees. And that's the question of cultural politics. What we're seeing, uh, and, and SOAS has, uh, I think had some backlash about this when the degree was introduced. Um, in places like the Daily Mail and so on, um, with claims about um, ignoring the white philosophers and, uh, and so on. 
Um, that, but what we've seen since then, even more, is a backlash against processes of decolonization um, going on within culture. We, we, uh, there's a kind of, there's the Black Lives Matter movement, which is an incredibly important movement and moment, but there's also the reaction to Black Lives Matter, which we're seeing particularly um, in, uh, well, I thought it was particularly in American and British uh, societies, but I also noticed recently um, discussions uh, with, in France about um, what they saw as the importation of American theory in, in the form of uh, critical race theory uh, and decolonization approaches, which is ironic because, of course, anyone who works in those fields knows that even though those kinds of debates are quite well developed within the Western, within the American Academy, many of the fundamental theorists um, are Francophone or French, like Kristeva, Franz Fanon, Foucault, Derrida, and so on. Um, and so, <laughs> but, but what this reflects is a kind of reaction against uh, what American conservatives have called cultural Marxism or critical race theory. We, we, we've even seen conservative politicians criticizing critical race theory. And I note, I think today, um, a government minister saying that to focus upon um, colonialism in school teaching in Britain would be, you know, adding on too many subjects, a dilution of quality and so on. And so there's this kind of resistance to these kinds of uh, developments and decolonizing trends. But for me, um, that in itself, those controversies actually demonstrate the cultural relevance of these kinds of approaches and these kinds of uh, degrees, because they reflect not only the shifting geopolitical context of our time, um, but they're also now hot button issues within our society and our culture. So um, that's. I think I'll stop there and um, that will give us a chance to um, have any questions and, and, and discussion that might come out of that. Thanks. Thank you so very much, uh, Richard. Um, I mean, uh, I think we had a lot of information uh, that got us thinking from all directions. Um, <laughs> very rich and um, very carefully developed. Thank you so much. Uh, Sean was right about the quality of uh, lecture we were going to get today and we did get it. So um, without um, wasting time, we would like um, questions and comments to emerge. Uh, please um, use the raise hand feature and um, go ahead with your questions, please. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's begin with um, Val. Uh, hi, thank you. Thank you so much for this extremely interesting talk. Um, my question is more, I guess, philosophical. <laughs> um, and I mean, with, with, the, with the issue of like using the word philosophy or like philosophies plural, and I mean, so thinking about kind of like an ideal world situation, right, in which like other than other philosophical traditions are taken seriously in their own right um, as proper, um, I don't know, not equals, but uh, on, the, on the same footing as the kind of Western tradition stemming from the Greek world or whatever. I mean, is there a use in that world for the word philosophy? I mean, even today, right, in, in the kind of very narrow way that we use the word philosophy to look at the Western tradition, there's already an extreme dilution of that term, right? I mean, philosophers who are working um, in philosophy of science do very, very different work from philosophers who are working on critical theory. And so to what extent is this even useful now? But in the broader sense of like looking at other traditions who actually do philosophy differently, right? The use of that, I think, is um, maybe comes into question. Um, though I also see the point of 
you know, we don't live in that ideal world. Um, and so there is a need for using this term philosophy just, you know, to create a sense that actually these are valid traditions that um, just look at things differently. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not, that they're lesser than the Western tradition and so on and so forth. So yeah, sorry if this is a bit confused. Um, I've been thinking about this recently and um, yeah, I would love to hear your slightly clearer thoughts on this. Thank you very much. Um, thanks Val. No, I, I think that, that that's very uh, clear. Um, yes, I, I think that the, the question of what counts as philosophy is um, for me something that should absolutely be at the foreground of this kind of project. And it's something that probably would you would never come to a definitive answer to because there are different ways in which you can respond to the question. I mean, you, you could say, for instance, as some have, well, you know, philosophy refers specifically to this thing, philosophia, that the Greeks invented. Uh, it's a particular kind of way of doing things, of thinking, um, and, and it only happens in the West, it, uh, unless it's exported uh, in that kind of way. Um, and whilst that can be seen as a kind of uh, ethnocentric construction of philosophy, um, it is a position that one can take. Because um, one can say, because I'm assuming that one isn't necessarily saying there, there, there is no interesting, let's say, abstract intellectual systematic thinking that went on outside of the West. If you're making that claim, then you're making an ethnocentric, perhaps even racist claim. But if you're, but if you're simply saying there's something in the West that's very, very particular and specific, and it's this kind of Greek-based origin tradition of, 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 of critical reflection, um, you could make the case that that's very, very Uh, because if you don't do that, then you have to give up the universal claim that philosophers often make, that, that philosophy is about the, the, the search for wisdom wherever it occurs. Um, and so um, I think there are different ways in which you could, you could kind of approach the, that question, as long as we're clear about the implications of how we define philosophy. And I, and I think that because it's a definitional question, we always have to look at the context of the discussion, because um, um, I, I can follow someone down different lines of argument about whether there is such a thing as Indian philosophy, there is Indian systematic thought, um, but I could equally say, was there anything like uh, Darshana or Anviksiki, which is kind of a, a analytic uh, investigative reasoning uh, in Sanskrit traditions, is there such a thing in the West? Uh, and so we can engage in, in that kind of uh, uh, discussion, but we have to keep in mind um, not only the definitional question, but the politic of it. Because of course, one of the reasons why we want to hold on to the idea of philosophy is about cultural prestige. Uh, philosophy has been used to um, present uh, particularly when it's used in a kind of ethnocentric way, to say the West has philosophy, um, to make often to make some kind of claim that, well, it's only in European for forms of thought that the kind of highest forms of rationality have been expressed. We, we find this, for instance, in, in Hegel at certain points in, in what he's saying, um, and, and, and other, other thinkers. Um, and, and so this, um, in, in that point of view, we have to also recognize the history in that, of course, theology was originally the queen of the sciences in, in the medieval university. But in the modern university after uh, the uh, Humboldt, in a sense, the Humboldtian university, philosophy was established as the queen of the sciences. I, I would argue that today in, in contemporary Britain, um, business studies is probably the queen of the sciences in terms of the, the most uh, dominant uh, model for uh, and success as well. But still there's this cultural prestige associated with the idea of philosophy. And as long as there's cultural prestige and a claim about higher forms of thinking, then I think it's perfectly 
acceptable for us to say, hold on, there are forms of thinking that we could call philosophy beyond uh, Euro-American thought. Thank you. Could I, could I do a quick follow-up on that, if that's all right? Sure. Um, yeah, is that OK um, with the SOAS part of things as well? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, please. Thanks. Um, so actually, um, I'm working at the moment on kind of um, potentially kind of the Mesopotamian and Egyptian origins of Greek thought. Um, and something that I struggle with a lot um, is kind of unlearning that Western bias. I ha I've had quite like a traditional philosophic education um, and so kind of thinking about things like um, epistemology and um, in a very kind of like boxed up way um, and so I find that oftentimes I'm perhaps like reading into these earlier traditions these Greek notions um, so I mean do you have any I don't know practical tips I guess on like how you can unlearn this western bias or this western way of thinking about what philosophy is perhaps um i, I would say that I'm, I'm not sure we can ever unlearn them in that kind of um pure way um but we can complicate them um uh, and so that's why um for me the whole question of the 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 kind of lexicon of of technical vocabulary that we use to interpret these different texts, traditions, myths, whatever, um, we have to be aware that they are lenses that we're wearing that have been formed in particular ways and for their own traditions. Uh, often when we're doing this in the Western Academy, we're doing this through the medium of, of, of English, for instance, uh, not always, but a European language, certainly. Um, and so um, always having that in the foreground of your study. So you're not just studying the ancient material that you're studying, you're also being reflexive about the framework that you're using to engage with that and, and, and thinking about that. I mean, that's that would that would kind of be my basic advice on that. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Um, I think we'll take two questions at a time. Um, yeah, uh, so you respond once to two questions, okay. yeah. Um, so let's have um, Beth and Mohammed. Yeah, your hands have been up for a long while. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, considering there was already a course for philosophy at the University of Kent, what was your thinking behind uh, making a separate course instead of innovating the current course and whether that ideology you referred to with the MPs was perhaps being mimicked in the university hierarchy and that there's no space in the current course to innovate. Uh, Mohammed? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, so like in science, physicists won't compete with biologists for the title of being a true scientist. So why is there this sort of notion in philosophy where there's a, only one true type of philosophy? Okay, thank you. Um, those questions actually dovetail with each other. And I would say that the, the reason why I introduced the, the degree, um, well, I, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you the, the kind of uh, uh, pragmatic economic side of it, is that the religious studies degree was getting less and less applicants. But, my, uh, but what we taught within that degree um, was very, very philosophical material across different cultural traditions and periods of history, but was not recognized as such because it was classified within this box called religious studies um, rather than being a, a philosophy. But we also had a philosophy department, which um, was quite comfortable with the, the, I think with the, with the way in which it, it's defined 
uh, and its current parameters and was and as resistant to um, the implications that perhaps it was uh, ethnocentric. Um, uh, and, and so I was not going to get much traction <laughs> institutionally by going the route that you suggested. Um, so uh, the route that I went was to, was to say, well, let's do something a little bit different. You, you do your philosophy thing uh, and, and you know, fine, you know, you, you're, you've got the students for that. We'll do our philosophy thing. My, my suspicion was that that would, if it was successful, would have been a takeover bit because I, because, because if it was me and I, as I said, I try and put myself in the position uh, of what I was thinking when I was 17 and applying for degrees, the degree that I was developing was exactly the degree I would have wanted to have studied, but it was not available. Um, and so uh, what, what's always happened throughout my time as a scholar of religion in small religious studies departments is that we have picked up lots of students in the system who find out that religious studies isn't the weird, strange Bible study that they thought it was. Um, and, and so we would always get a lot of philosophy students who would switch and do a religious studies degree. So based upon that anecdotal evidence, I thought if I'd built a degree which foregrounded and named itself as doing this, that that would capture those people at an earlier stage. Um, but you know, I, I, you're always in these contexts working in, um, in terms of these uh, territorial bases, which are what departments really are in that, in that kind of context. Um, to answer Mohammed's question, um, I'm not sure I'm gonna give a good answer to this, but, but uh, um, maybe other people would, would, would give a good answer to this, but um, I think it's the role that philosophy has played in um, certainly the last few centuries um, as being seen as the pinnacle of human intellectual reflection. There's a kind of hierarchy of like higher level reflection and philosophy has often been seen as the highest level of reflection of systematic rationality, if you like. Uh, and whenever you make claims of rationality that you then particularize, whether it's to this is this is rationality and this isn't, or these people have this ability or this tradition of thought and these people don't, then you get involved in um, cultural politics, uh, uh, which, which in, in the period in which this was happening, of course, gets folded into colonialism and, col uh, uh, and the justification of colonialism. And if we have the highest form of rationality and it's expressed through this thing we call philosophy, which Socrates did, and then the Europeans did it, maybe, maybe the Muslims did it for a while, but um, for instance, that there's often this kind of idea that the Muslim culture acted as the kind of postal workers for, for, for philosophy. So they, they took what Aristotle and Plato said, carried it around for a few centuries and then passed it back to the Europeans who then Used, used it and developed it and so on. That kind of model um, ref, uh, suggests that philosophy has been deployed uh, as a uh, technology for uh, justifying colonial superiority of the West. Uh, and that's one reason why that has been uh, a contested issue. Maybe other people have something to say on that, I don't know. Thank you, Richard. Um, uh, let's hear from uh, um, Andrew and then Michael. Um, thanks, Richard, very much for your talk and apologies for coming in a bit late. Um, I just have a question on, um, um, uh, it might be a bit about the adjunctive side you talked about, which is kind of, oh, oh, so you're doing that over here too. And it kind of seeing one's own values spread out. Um, and, and specifically in terms of terminology, um, so thinking about what are the what are the limits of using specific terminology that we might find within our own traditions to describe um, activity that we might find similar in other traditions. So what's what's the limit of terminology there? So I'm thinking, for example, you know, a classic thing might be like Plato's Aedos. Sometimes that's compared with Samanya in Sanskrit. And you have to excuse my pronunciation. I'm not a Sanskrit specialist. Um, 
but and so what's the limits of kind of using key terms from our own traditions um and the second related question would be about time and focus so in this when we think about more than one tradition do we do injustice um in the sense of not giving time for literally just thinking about Samanya for a few weeks, as opposed to kind of trying to desperately compare two or three different traditions in one session. And I think that's my anxiety as a, as a lecturer sometimes actually, is not giving justice that that's needed to be. So those are kind of the two related questions, the limits of terminology and on related note, um, kind of giving, giving time to, to am, ample time for various traditions uh, in this comparative type model. So that's, yeah, those are my two questions. Uh, do you want me to take those two questions and then, or? Yeah, or, that's yeah, fine. Michael. Okay, that's fine. Um, thanks, Andrew. Um, they're very good questions and I don't think they have, uh, for me, I don't have definitive answers on them, I, 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 but I do have something to say on them. And, and I guess, one of the challenges here is um, trying to think systematically and get students to think systematically in a modularized system of knowledge. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're always we're always packaging things uh, within a certain number of weeks within a semester. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and I don't want to underestimate the, the impact that has upon deep reflection. Uh, and I don't think that's just about global philosophies. I think that's about the kind of kind of education that we're pushed model of education we're pushed into. So there will always be that question of, you know, how do we find the time to kind of get into the in-depth meanings of Samanya uh, or whatever the concept is uh, in, in a kind of way that we find ethically responsible, let's say. Uh, we're always having to cut corners to be broad. Um, uh, so I don't think there's a definitive answer to that in that framework. On the question of terminology, limits of terminology, um, for me, again, I think it's a question of always, of never re resting comfortably with the translated terminology that we are using. It's not that we can't use it, but, but that we have to keep always coming back to the question of this is a translation of, a, of a, a term or a concept or a practice that's, uh, and, and we have to pull, pull that back. So in other words, there's always a footnote to the use of the, of the terminology. And I would also, I also, um, someone who's, I quite like uh, Talal Assad's idea in Genealogies of Religion. He talks about the inequality of languages and the fact that um, in the modern academy, for instance, um, Sanskrit is unequal to English. In English is a hegemonic linguistic medium. And so when we're dealing with uh, traditions and languages that are not the dominant languages that we're using, then, we, then, then he argues that we, we have to maintain a certain kind of scandalous element in the translation. The translation has to maintain the otherness of the original just to constantly remind us when we're using the term that this doesn't easily translate into the lexicon of the words that we're used to using. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I quite like that as a kind of methodological um, reminder of, of holding on to that kind of scandalous nature of the original language. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Michael, I think you can go ahead now, then Anya. Thank you. And I really enjoyed that talk. I think it's really interesting. It was a nice way to kind of, as we're coming to the end of my degree at, at SARAS, it's a, it's a nice look back to see, you know, how it came into, into being, which was really, really quite nice, actually. Um, so my question is twofold. So firstly, do you think that mm -hmm. the making of philosophy into this institution, particularly by um, by the British government at the moment. Uh, and by that, I mean locating it kind of in this conversation, this very anxious conversation about uh, identity, crit critical race theory. Um, if you think that locating it there is making it um, actually more difficult to expand and, and the, the project that we're trying to do with world philosophies. And secondly, do you think that we run the risk in world philosophies or global philosophies of becoming just this critical commentary on the analytic tradition and, and how would you kind of counteract that in any um, courses that you would construct? Okay, 
thanks, Michael. Um, yes, I, 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 I quite like the use of the word anxious there because I think I think it is there. there there's a lot, lot of anxieties in that, and I, and I'm someone who actually thinks it's important to uh, express anxieties and hold on to anxieties when we're dealing with these kind of complex issues and issues of power imbalance and cultural translation and so on. Um, on on the first question, which I took to mean um, something like this, um, is is this a kind of a dangerous kind of not exactly a blind alley, but a dangerously narrow way of of going? If if we focus, if we kind of link this to discussions of critical race theory, reactions to Black Lives Matter, decolonization, is that was that your I think because this is much clearer in my head when I wrote it down, um, but more along the lines of, is it more so that we're being um, shoehorned by states that very much want to politicize changing disciplines like philosophies into an attack on Britishness, an attack um, on the status quo as we know it? And is it actually not us expanding the discipline that's becoming the problem, but rather that we are um, creating or we, we are um, a kind of response or a trigger for the, the anxiousness that people feel around Brexit or around Brexit. Okay. Um, I, I would, from my own experience, I would say that I don't experience this as a reaction to recent government uh, statements. I, I, I've been working in this field for over 25 years, thinking about these kinds of questions. What's surprising to me is that this has become a uh, sufficiently uh, uh, noticed by um, political figures on the right that they are, to use a phrase that's used quite often now, weaponizing it um, in, in a kind of cultural politics uh, 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 and the construction of things like cultural Marxism, which is apparently the, uh, and, and deploying that in certain kinds of ways um, in a way that I, I, and I may be wrong here, but I, but I saw this as something that was developed initially in, in the US amongst Republican uh, groups and then has caught on in British uh, um, context. And that's why I was, I was, I thought it was Anglo-American, but then I noticed that this was also happening in, uh, in France and no doubt elsewhere. Um, so for me, I don't see it as a reaction, the reaction is the other way around. Finally, uh, I've gone my entire year, uh, my entire career without any politician noticing anything I ever wrote or said, finally politicians are actually commenting upon the kind of area that I've been working in. Um, uh, and I found that uh, a little bit perplexing, but I also think that, that they're, that's also capturing a moment. That there, are, there are shifts going on. There are geopolitical shifts going on. Brexit is an example, a complex example of British reaction to um, to its own empire and its own history and how, how we make sense of that, how we uh, narrate who we are in a post imperial context. I'm always surprised how long it takes for these things to enter into the public consciousness. Um, and that's why I was interested in the Foucault point because I think that what Foucault was es essentially saying was that em the, em the European empires, the British empire ended just after, effectively after the second world war. That's that's a quite a long time ago from the point of view of an individual human being, but it takes, it seems to take many generations for the uh, impact of that culturally to, to start to unfold. And I see Brexit as part of a reaction to that unfolding impact of the fact that Britain no longer rules the world and, and, it, and, it, and it's not going to go back to being ruler of the world. And, and, and how you come to terms with that. And there are, of course, different reactions. So, so I see the reaction as going on, not from the academics, as from the politicians who are now seizing upon what academics are, are saying on that. Um, and then your, other, your second question was about whether, whether we end up engaging in too much critical commentary and not enough philosophy. Is that? Um, I think there is a danger of, of doing that too much. I mean, you could... I mean, I could spend an entire course talking about the issues of translating certain Indian philosophical terms into Western ones without actually talking about the Indian traditions. And that's why I think that the, it's important that there are courses that focus on 
the, the primary remit of those courses is let's get into the nitty gritty of these particular traditions and practices and, and so on. But I don't think, I think we need to be aware of these kind of methodological and critical lenses, but in some courses they would be foregrounded a lot and in some they would be there, but they wouldn't be necessarily, you know, always on the, on the front page. Thank you. I phrased my questions poorly, but that, that organization of, of philosophy in this cultural debate we're having now is, is precisely what I was getting at. So thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you. Uh, Anya, and, and then um, Missy, sorry, I think I'm um, struggling to pronounce your name. Max is fine. Max is Good. Fine. Good. Thank you. So Anya, and then you, you go ahead. Um, hi, um, Richard. I have to say it's a pleasure to meet you. I cite you all the time in my essays and it's wonderful. It's very strange and wonderful to be able to put a face to the King colon 1999. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, as you have many times before, you've wonderfully put, um, given me words to um, explain you know, conflicting feelings that I've had um, in readings that I've done and concepts that I've um, studied. So today it's been the idea of transformational philosophy. I wish I had this terminology a couple of weeks ago. I was writing an essay about this for Elvis. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I wanted to ask you about, um, I mean, I really appreciate how optimistic you were um, at the end of your talk, um, you know, bringing up Black Lives Matter. But I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the, you know, the realities of this. So I cannot see how in today's climate with, uh, with the marketization of universities happening um, in a very real way that is affecting, you know, um, the academics, it's so close to my heart, um, their workloads, um, it doesn't seem like it's enabling space for this transformational um, philosophy to grow and prosper um, and, you know, ideally overtake whatever the usual, you know, old colonial version of philosophy um, that persists in every other UK university. So I just, I, how can it happen with our academics not losing their poor minds um, in in the social structure that we've got in in this marketized system. I, I just can't fathom it because I mean everyone's getting axed, you know, as you said, these departments are shrinking. So it seems counterproductive to put energy into um, changing it's like shoveling the snow while it's still snowing, I suppose. And because I'm thinking about my career, of course, and I would love, it, it was my dream to be an academic, but it's seeming so difficult. And I'm wondering whether my energy is more, um, it, it'd be more targeted use of my um, skills to try and change the structure of um, you know, the world and the government to enable transform transformative philosophy to um, blossom. Are we, uh, shall I respond to that? Uh, okay, uh, maybe uh, Ms. Emiliano, please yeah. uh, ask your question. Yeah, uh, actually my question is also related to this. Mm, it, first of all, it's, it's a great um, uh, speech. I, I really enjoyed the, uh, uh, the speech and I really enjoy people who push the boundaries of um, philosophy and it's nice to be back to at a source I did my PhD there and now I'm teaching Chinese philosophy at the Department of Philosophy at the Warwick University. One thing that I noticed uh, when I started teaching uh, here is that uh, actually students are really enthusiastic about non-Western non philosophies. So my point is that we are talking about there is no market for um, this kind of uh, modules or this kind of uh, courses, but uh, are we really sure there is no market or it's a political problem? And uh, the, the market is there, but there is resistance. 
even to, to, to try to, 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 to taste the market. So in the end, my question for you is how do we change uh, the politics of, uh, of uh, philosophy department? Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks Max, thanks for that. Um, again, thanks, I, I, it's really good that these are dovetailing these kinds of questions. Um, on, um, on Anya's point, um, I, I, I feel your pain uh, as someone um, wanting to move into an academic uh, career or considering it in, in, in the current kind of climate, because you're right, I, I, I kind of left it on a slightly optimistic note, but, um, but we are looking at the harsh realities. We're looking at a, a kind of constriction of humanities, um, the marketization of universities, um, but, um, and so I, I actually want to support you in like your ideas of direct political <laughs> engagement. Why, why not? Um, that, um, but, but on the other side of that, I, I do think, and this is also I tried to answer uh, Max's er early point was that this, um, it's not a, it's not a purely bleak outlook. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one of them is that there is a um, the increasing awareness of issues like Black Lives Matter, decolonization, and so on, in the in the mass media now, is allowing the terms for a cultural conversation, um, which universities, even university managers, cannot ignore. Um, and um, as somewhere like SOAS, which has a very diverse um, ethnic uh, group of students, uh, the, the voices of those students in saying, you know, why, why am I only ever hearing about dead white males and so on, uh, is an, an, an important, powerful uh, voice in a marketized context, because students are, the consumer is always right in, in, in that. We might not like that, that model, but that's, that's the model that we're placed within. Um, so I'm quite optimistic in the sense that uh, responding to Max's point, I actually think that the, the in, within the younger generation, these kinds of issues are um, much more natural to think about. I mean, I mean, notions of um, acceptance of different different forms of of sexuality, of different different kinds of uh, gender formations of, of uh, people of different ethnic groups, just you know, of course we're equal. You know, why would why would we not be equal? That kind of baseline um, idea within younger younger British generation, for instance, I think, um, means that these kinds of questions, when they suddenly encounter what you mean philosophy, I don't get to hear. I don't get to hear about what you know, black Africans or or, or Indian people thought about anything. Why? Um, those kinds of questions come up because of that cult, that shift, I think. Um, but there are two other process, two other aspects of this. One is that universities, perhaps not in this particular moment because of the pandemic and Brexit, but even with Brexit, uh, the managers are constantly talking about internationalization. And what they often think of this uh, in terms of is making lucrative links with like, Chinese universities or something like that to get to get kind of recruitment numbers up. But there is a side of that, which is about the internationalization of curriculum. Um, and the kind of thing that World Philosophies at SOAS is doing is a brilliant example of internationalization. Uh, and so within the institutional framework of universities, that's a voice that can kind of capture some traction. Um, but then finally, I think, um, the very problem creates uh, a reaction. Um, and I think that the very fact that universities have been marketized so much, and we live in such a marketized, instrumentalized society, I think, uh, maybe I am naive in this regard, um, means that, that there will be some people, some young people who respond to that by saying, you know what, if I'm gonna go to university and I'm gonna have to pay fees for it, I'm damn well going to do something that I'm interested in, uh, and and that gives me some some to fill this kind of spiritual vacuum that I get from everything else that's out there. So I'm really going to do this as a kind of vocational thing. 
Um, and I think the more and more people feel commodified, um, there will be people and are people who say, no, I'm not having this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of explore these things because, because you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a rounded human being, not just a, a worker in the global economy. So I actually think the marketization as it, as it speeds up creates, I think, a kind of possible uh, market, ironically, <laughs> for, for people who, who are, are against or, or resistant to that. Um, so I don't know if that answers. Um, so I think that, that's my response to Max's point as well. Are we sure there's no market? I, I think that I think that there is, and I think that uh, somewhere like SOAS is ideally placed to, uh, if, if of any institution uh, in the UK and probably around the world, to kind of pioneer this this kind of uh, project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for your questions. Uh, Sean? Thank you, Richard. That was really great. Really good to hear. Um, when you were talking about your program development at Kent and you were kind of listing the various difficulties that were faced and kind of getting it off the ground and getting that kind of cooperation and so on, it struck me that perhaps, I mean, you in some ways you cover it when you talk about that, you know, there's this kind of backlash. Um, but I think I would kind of push you to be a bit more specific about it. And that is that philosophy itself is a racist discipline, um, racist by omission for sure, um, but racist in its preoccupations, in its faculty, in its um, reliance on its canon, um, its total failure to address the racist comments made by philosophers, at least from the enlightenment onwards, where at least we have a concept of, of race. Um, and so on. And, and, you know, when we had that big debacle with the Daily Mail kind of saying that we were, um, you know, removing all white philosophers from the curriculum, etc. My point back to that was um, actually what's more problematic? The fact that we want to include people of colour on our curriculum or the fact that philosophy departments do not under any circumstance include uh, any work by anyone from any other philosophical tradition, let alone what color they are. Um, so I'm kind of wondering, my question, <laughs> so this is, this is a question rather than a comment, um, is what is to be done to tackle the racism of philosophy as kind of one of the major stumbling blocks to enabling world philosophy to become philosophy, to become normative, to become just the way philosophy has done. Um, thanks for pushing me on that regard. <laughs> I, think, I think, again, this partly depends, this can depend on, on circumstances. So, for instance, if you're working in an institution where the philosophy department is much bigger and much more powerful and recruiting a lot more students than, say, a religious studies department, then you don't really have the power to uh, for that kind of full frontal direct challenge. I mean, just in terms of strategy, it's just not going to work uh, because it's going to also alienate colleagues who in other regards might be seen as um, working uh, in, you know, in synergy with you. But I, but I, um, but I think SOAS is slightly different because you didn't, you didn't, you don't have that issue. You don't, you, 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 um, you have, sure you have issues of having to resist those those kinds of ideologies and those beliefs, but but um, but you don't have an institutional department within SOAS that's pushing back all the time, saying, "Hold on a minute, we're doing the philosophy, get off our territory." Um, so I think that that can be. Um, it depends on on the context. Um, I would say that the problem with philosophy departments, almost universally, is that they are racist. Um, even if it's a form of racism that most of them are not uh, in, uh, sort of prepared to engage with. And it's often a kind of lazy, lazy racism because they've not been challenged. So um, not at Kent, but another institution that I worked at where there was a philosophy department, um, I was, 
I, I gave a, a talk about expanding philosophy many years ago. Uh, and one of the um, professors in the philosophy department said, didn't go to my talk, but said, but knew I'd given it and said, why do you, why do you think it is that philosophy departments don't teach Indian philosophy apart from the obvious reason? And I said, what's the obvious reason? And he said, we don't have time. You know, we, we've got all of these other thinkers to look at. We don't have, and it's the same argument that the Tory minister made about colonialism. We haven't got, we haven't got the space in, to, to consider this. And that's because they consider this a kind of marginal add-on to the real stuff rather than something that actually transforms your understanding of what you're doing. Um, and so I would say that what, we really have to do, and there are some people who've written written about this, uh, you, you yourself, myself, and other people, is actually confront them more and more with the realities of that kind of soft, incipient racism, um, because then they have to defend themselves. And then once they start putting out their arguments and then realizing that their, those arguments don't hold much water, then, then, then we might see some traction. But it's a difficult one because, as I say, you can end up alienating colleagues. Thank you, Richard. Um, Beth, you have the um, the last question. But before that, I, I just wanted to um, bring uh, Richard's attention back to what you said about uh, philosophy's uh, self-critique, uh, the philosophy of philosophy. Uh, what what is often called meta philosophy. Yeah. I think I think even in the West, it it only exists um, in the very strict sense of analytic philosophy. Remember, remember Wittgenstein and and even recently Timothy Williams's uh, 2007 book on philosophy of philosophy is still very much in that. Although he's a critic of the analytic philosophy, he's still very much in that analytic tradition. But um, I was just thinking, is it not therefore very, very important that in designing a program on um, world philosophies or global philosophy that we begin, at, at least the students, first of all, uh, introduced to a module of uh, meta philosophy or, or philosophy self-critic, you know, and really play around that concept of philosophy and see exactly in what working definition um, it means all through that program. But I think um, it really got me thinking what you mentioned. We really don't engage with philosophy itself. You know, we just have this assumption and presupposition that we know what we are talking about. I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, thanks, Elvis. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. And I think that um, for me, if I if I could kind of build a program that wasn't based upon like fitting certain colleagues in certain courses and so on, uh, I would absolutely start off with a with some kind of discussion of what philosophy is, um, the the notion of philosophia. I, I would go to different cultural places and time periods, and I would foreground that question of you know, what is this thing called philosophy? And I would foreground it not in the form of, I'm informing the student what philosophy is, so you know what you're going to study for the next three, four years, but in letting them know that this is a question they will continue to think about throughout their degree, that there's no clear answer. And I'm not introducing them to a canon, I'm introducing them to a problem. Um, and so I, that, that's how I would, I would approach that. Uh, that approach. And I think one way to do that is precisely to hone in on the question of where did it begin? Because that can open up that, that kind of discussion. I think Beth is... Beth, go for it. Hi. Um, yeah, Beth, go for it. <laughs> how would you respond to um, the... This relates to the last couple of questions. How would you respond to the idea that to make what is regarded within this call as um a, i'm trying not to say better our concept of philosophy but the way that the people on this call have expanded philosophy in universities with these degrees and considering as we've said that humanities are being axed so much in higher education 
would you perhaps consider that we could use the platform of higher education to inform lower levels of education in A level and GCSE where those core subjects are a bit more secure within a GCSE and A level to perhaps change that curriculum that's actually more achievable than getting individual universities to innovate their degrees. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are some um, uh, hurdles there. And I, I, back in the 60s, talking in terms of religious studies now, um, there was a time when, because of changes going on in British society, recognition of greater multiculturalism, um, migration of diaspora communities in, into Britain after the war, there was a kind of recognition that the old way of doing the study of religion was a bit too Christian, a bit too theological, and that perhaps there might be a space for a kind of multicultural, multi-religious uh, space. And that's where departments like the University of Lancaster, Department of Religious Studies, and the University of Kent were both um, founded in, in that 1960s moment, where there was a, there was a, a opportunity to say, look, the way we're studying this doesn't necessarily map the demographic of, of British society. We need to kind of expand this out. Uh, but that, that was an interesting moment because at that time in the 60s, um, those who decided on school curriculum were still in conversation with uh, academics in higher education. I think the challenge today is there's, there's a separation and universities aren't listened to um, by government ministers. They don't look to universities to necessarily define school curriculum in that way. What we find is we find government, government ministers increasingly interfering, um, bringing their own like agenda of what they think a good education is uh, without necessarily bringing in, certainly in our area, uh, um, people who, who work within that field. So there's a question of isolation, political isolation for universities there. Um, but I, I agree, I think if you, if you can insert those at an earlier stage in the curriculum, then, then that is um, so much better. Because of course, my experience in recent times with um, 9K fees is that the student applicant body are sometimes be quite conservative and quite understandably so. I mean, it, it, people might say, well, I'm not gonna go and do a degree in that subject because I don't know what it's about. I, I never heard about this at school. So I'll do English or history or, or something like that. Um, and so if we can embed those ideas earlier, then people will become aware of them and, and they're much more likely to apply to university to study them and put pressure on institutions to internationalize. But the question is how you how how, you, how the institutions get more traction with politicians um, in terms of uh, being involved in those curricular discussions. As a tiny follow up, if that's okay, um, I think it's an interesting um, thought that perhaps the inclusion of non Western ideologies um, be almost a requirement as much as a a certain grade at A-level to get into university, you know, that like they talk about Western philosophy, philosophy being the basis of knowledge and then everything is additional, like you were saying, where it's almost like half of your knowledge is not there. So it, I wonder if there is a position that universities could have that while they say you have to know this, this and this and be at this standard of education to come to university, you also have to have a more informed knowledge, not just that specific. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that, the, that there could be more done there. And I think that the kind of model of universities as a kind of factory for people who are then going to work in, in global capitalism doesn't even fulfill itself. Because um, if you really want your graduates to become CEOs of international globally relevant companies, let's say, if that's, the kind, if that's the kind of aim you're looking for, then they need to be globally trained as citizens as well. Um, they, need, they need to understand what, what it is to think um, in different cultural contexts and so on. And, and, I, and I think we probably could do more as academics in making that case uh, for the humanities uh, 
in that kind of globalized space. Thank you, Richard. I know uh, we've um, gone over time a bit, but I was just wondering if you could quickly respond to one more question. Um, Alex raised it in the chat. Uh, Alex, would you like to um, just um, ask verbally? Or should, um, should I read it out? So, um, yeah, I know it was about um, labels, use of labels, German, Indian, European. Um, sorry, let me just see if I can get the question. Yeah, so if I may write a uh, um, question, but okay. I have a question about a few of the labels that are commonly used, uh, assuming that labels, are, that labels are important for content, at least indirectly. Like many of us, you, use, you speak of uh, Indian, European, German, French, it is a philosophies. There are, of course, these are, of course, names of current geopolitical entities. With German philosophy, one could perhaps try to speak of German speaking philosophy to capture anything from Kant, uh, yeah, to Wittgenstein and all of that. However, that won't work for terms like European or Indian. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on this or perhaps a pragmatic solution. Yeah, thanks for an amazing lecture. Um, thanks. Um, so um, yes, I mean, again, we're caught here in a space between um, a modularized framework of knowledge where you have to present and market um, modules in a particular kind of way. So, so um, if I'm teaching a course on what I might describe as Indian philosophy, uh, but in the description you'd realize that I'm not looking at the entirety of Indian philosophy because no one could in a modular structure. Um, uh, for instance, um, why is uh, Islamic thought not very often taught in a course on Indian philosophy, uh, where, whereas you know there have been uh, Islam has been an important part of Indian culture for a very very long time, um, but because of these kinds of regional cultural kind of divisions, I mean I, I for instance what I teach is really a kind of in in, in Indian philosophy courses is really a kind of um, high Sanskrit um, uh, schol scholastic literature um, and and I think it's important to, to to show that you're doing that in the description and also to question the terms of that at some point within the course um, so for instance in my Indian philosophy course at Kent I spend the first three weeks talking about what philosophy is and what Indian philosophy is before we even get into any of the the, the nitty-gritty um, but you also have to be aware of the fact that that students might not necessarily opt for a course that's called high Sanskrit classical um, intellectual re uh, thinking. Uh, they're, they're looking for something that they understand is called Indian philosophy. And so we're constantly caught with the, these labels which are there to kind of convey a certain fudged idea that people will understand. And then it's in the context of the course, I think, where, it, where it's our responsibility to complicate that label. Thank you very much, um, uh, Richard. We really want to express our sincere gratitude to you that you honored us and um, uh, you, were, you made yourself available for the first edition of um, the Swaz World Philosophy Lecture Series. Although we gave you quite a short notice, um, but you did uh, real justice to the, to the topic and everyone benefited one way or the other from it. Thank you so very much. And uh, thank you all for coming and um, for sharing your questions, your comments, both uh, verbally on the chat. We'll thank be looking you for forward. Organizing this. Yeah. We'll be looking forward to seeing you on April 30, which will be the second edition, and with another speaker and another theme. And we'll usually we'll inform you through the usual channels as well. Thank you all for being here and we wish you a beautiful weekend ahead. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Richard. That was fantastic. Uh, so